I want you to welcome this morning our keynote speaker, Vint Cerf. Well, good morning, everyone. Am I audible in the back? The, the usual question is, can you hear me back there in the rear? And of course, the correct answer is no, we ain't built that way. Um, sorry about that, minus two. First of all, uh, this is a particularly lovely opportunity to return to Paris uh, to um, participate in this amazing uh, conjoint pair of important conferences, ECRC and CHI. And I'm particularly honored that I happen to be serving as president of ACM at this time. Uh, this is the first time we've uh, had this scale of, uh, of combinations of uh, conferences. I understand some 3,400 people uh, have registered. Uh, 2,000 papers submitted to CHI, of which 400 were accepted. Uh, and I don't know the statistics for ECRC, but I imagine that they are uh, um, probably comparable. It's certainly uh, seeing all of you in the room this morning uh, is astonishing and very, very satisfying. I think one of the most important things uh, that we can learn from uh, this kind of conference is that the casual interactions that you have with each other may be as important or more important than anything you might hear uh, in a plenary session like this. So I want to encourage all of you uh, to continue to pursue those connections, meeting old friends and making new ones, and helping to progress the understanding of computer science uh, in general. Uh, I was amused by Wendy's comment that this is the Wendy conference or the Wendy show, which must make me Peter Pan because I'm sandwiched between the two Wendy's. <laughs> and it's very fitting. People say, what do you want to do when you grow up? And of course, the answer is, why would I want to grow up? So uh, I thought I would uh, venture into territory, which is not my uh, field of expertise, to explore a little bit about what I have been observing on our interactions with computer-based systems. And so I hope that you'll forgive a somewhat lightweight treatment compared to what I know you are all capable of doing. But I hope this may stimulate some uh, ideas and maybe even some reactions uh, at the end of uh, my remarks. Let me start out by uh, uh, remembering uh, a recent comment by the Google uh, executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, when he was wearing Google Glass. And he said it was a weird feeling to be talking to his glasses uh, in order to activate it because there was no keyboard or anything else. You literally had to tell it what you wanted it to do or possibly use gestures. Uh, it reminded me of something that happened at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center uh, in the early 1970s. A version of the Bravo editor was outfitted with a voice interface. And I don't recall who it was that did this experiment, but was sitting in his office speaking to the computer to get it to perform editing functions that you would normally use a keyboard and a mouse for. And he couldn't do it for more than about five minutes. And then he came out and he said, I feel kind of like an idiot because I'm in this room all by myself saying open, insert, delete. And it's an odd kind of conversation to be having, and he, did, he was very uncomfortable. I think Eric's comments reflect a little bit of that. What that suggests to me is that we should be shooting not for commands and command recognition, but for real conversation. And I think many of you uh, are already pushing the edges of what is possible in terms of engaging in a two-way interaction with computer-based systems in order to explain what it is you want to have done. Uh, some of you will remember Majel Roddenberry, uh, who was uh, a very important part in the original Star Trek and then later in Star Trek Next Generation, but it was her voice that was uh, used as the computer. So when uh, Captain Picard would say, computer, uh, and, and you heard later computing, that was Majel Roddenberry. Uh, I actually had hoped someday that we could get enough of her voice recordings that we could make the uh, Android operating system have a Majel Roddenberry version. Uh, I think we haven't quite worked all that out yet, but I think it would be rather amusing. 
And finally, many of you will remember Star Trek IV and the scene where Scotty is uh, trying to uh, use a Macintosh computer to invent transparent aluminum. And he sits down in front of the computer and says, computer, and nothing happens. Then he says, hello, computer, and nothing happens. And the manager of the manufacturing plant is looking at him like, where, who is this weirdo? And obviously, he's Scottish. That must be his problem. And, and then uh, McCoy hands him the mouse. And he takes it and says, computer. And that doesn't work. And that's the picture you're seeing here. So we've had our troubles even in the 24th century, trying to learn how to interact with these things. Here's another one. Um, this is Larry, uh, uh, Sergey Brin wearing uh, Google Glass. But I want you to imagine the following possible conversation. We can't quite do this, but we aren't very far away from it. And the parts that we can't do, I hope you figure out how to do. Here's the scene. We have a blind German speaker wearing Google Glass. We have a deaf ASL signer wearing Google Glass, and they are trying to communicate with each other. Well, let's begin with our uh, blind speaker who speaks in German and says, Guten Morgen, uh, ich heiße Winzerf. Now, let's imagine what happens. The deaf guy's Google Glass hears the speech in German translates this, or does speech recognition, converts it to text, converts the German text to English, presents the English as captions in the Google Glass projector. So the deaf guy sees, good morning, my name is Vince Cerf. Our deaf uh, correspondent signs an answer, and that uh, signing is picked up by the Google Glass video uh, receiver television camera, and translates the signs into uh, English text, translates the English text into German, and then does text-to-speech to speak the German to the blind guy. Now, that is sounding a little like science fiction, but I think we can do almost all of that, except that recognizing signs might be pretty tough. And although I'm no expert in either signing or in image processing or video uh, interpretation, I have this uh, you know, fantasy that maybe if you take high-speed images so that you, the computer can look at the uh, signing slowed down to observe the gestures, uh, that might actually help make this work. But the fact is that we aren't very far away from being able to do things like that. Um, for, for me, in a way, this is like the definition of engineering, which is translating science fiction into reality. And that's what I think many of you have been doing for many of us for many years. So the other thing which uh, I think is uh, a part of this equation is the idea that we put computers into the same sensory environment that we are in so that they share with the same sensory inputs that we have. It's pretty clear that computers can hear with microphones. They can see with video cameras with varying degrees of uh, resolution. Uh, it's even possible to imagine that we could outfit our hands or other parts of our body with haptic response devices so that when we make gestures or when we do or say something, if there is a tactile response, we could, it could be uh, made uh, apparent to us so that the computers can actually help us sense a tactile uh, response of some kind. And I think we've seen uh, some interesting experimental gear that tries to outfit people with haptic interfaces. You can imagine uh, in, a, in a fantasy world the possibility that uh, a surgeon who's performing surgery on a patient who, uh, whose body has been uh, high-resolution MRI scanned so that the uh, operational uh, surgical area is well understood, the system could actually prevent the uh, surgeon from going to somewhere where his scalpel should not go. Now, that's uh, not quite realistic, but it is uh, something you could imagine trying to do. In fact, people at SRI International, uh, I think, pursued that particular idea some time ago. So we have these many different ways of helping the computer engage with us. And I think what's very important is that we are helping the computer become part of the context in which we're interacting uh, in the world. 
And that allows it to make relevant kinds of responses to add information to augment reality, to borrow a term. Uh, and I'm very excited about that because I have the sense that we're at a point now where there's enough computing power where if necessary we can export the need for computing power into clouds using wireless communication and the internet. So that some of these applications are, are now feasible. They don't have to all be executed by the mobile that we're carrying in our hands or in our pockets, but we can engage all of the computing power that's available on the net as well. Uh, the 3D environments are also equally interesting, although anyone who's a Star Trek fan like I am, very disappointed with the quality of the caves that we can build today. I mean, they're not palpable, but maybe the haptic interfaces can, uh, can uh, improve that possibility. I do wonder about the following uh, scenario, though. Can you imagine someone wearing one of those 3D headsets, you know, as it covers your entire face, and as you move your field of view, the, the image that you see changes in order to give you the sense that you're walking around in a three-dimensional space, and you could even imagine having it uh, sufficiently uh, sensitive to motion that you could walk around and actually look at things that are in the field of view. But imagine that the intent now is to have a, a uh, uh, video kind of exchange with someone who is also in that same three-dimensional environment. Maybe this is uh, a 3D presentation of a uh, blown up photomicrograph, or maybe it's a simulation of some kind and you are walking around inside the simulated view having a discussion with each other. The thing is that if you actually took an image of what you look like while you're wearing this thing, what you would see is not the person's face, but this really bizarre looking Darth Vader helmet that they're wearing. So that doesn't work. And I don't quite understand how we're going to do uh, the kind of typical video conferencing we do today with things like Google Hangout or Skype. Uh, we're going to have to create a false avatar of what you actually look like because we can't actually put a camera on you wearing your Darth Vader helmet. So I'm not sure how that, that's going to get solved, but you can almost predict what will happen. A business will be created for creating avatars for you to look better than you really do to the party that you're uh, interacting with. Uh, another thing which I just read about and perhaps even has, uh, has been uh, demonstrated uh, here uh, is what Carnegie Mellon has been doing by projecting uh, images onto available surfaces. Some of you will also remember the work at MIT Media Lab called Sixth Sense in Patty May's group. Uh, the idea is that any surface could become a display area and more important, any interaction that you have with that surface, gestures that you make uh, in the neighborhood of that surface could be recognized by the machine. And so once again, we are partnering with the computer in order to have it help us uh, carry out some function, and it is conscious of the context in which we are doing this. Many of you will remember Mark Weiser, who wrote uh, about and spoke very passionately about this notion of ubiquitous computing where the computing functionality simply disappeared into the environment. You didn't actually see things as computers, as display screens, as mobiles, or anything else. Everything had a computer-based capability. It had some ability to either display or to articulate or, or, or uh, speak or otherwise indicate uh, the state that it was in and maybe indicate a response to something you wanted it to do. But, but we are, it, as we approach that environment, we have to uh, imagine that it's a very different kind of world. Our cognitive sense of being part of a computing environment changes from I'm sitting in front of my laptop, I'm holding my mobile, to simply being surrounded by a room full of equipment and the room itself being fully capable of computing, communicating, and interacting. So this leads me to observe that we are already uh, approaching this vision that Mark Weiser had Devices that uh, I never anticipated in you know, 30 or 40 years ago would be part of the internet environment now are things like a refrigerator uh, or a picture frame uh, or uh, a mobile, which in, the 19, in 1973, the only guy that really knew what mobiles, what were possible with mobiles was Marty Cooper. Uh, and it took him 10 years from 1973 to 83 to get to the point where that big Motorola brick was finally functional. It was, uh, I didn't realize what the dates were until recently, and ironically, that's in parallel with the internet. Bob Kahn and I started the work in 73, and we couldn't actually turn it on and, and release it into operation until 1983, so somehow the mobile and the internet 
uh, been par paralleling each other historically for all this time. Um, then there's uh, the guy in the middle with the internet-enabled surfboard. I, I don't know him, but I have this image of he's sitting on the water thinking, you know, if I had a laptop on my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting for the next wave. So he put a laptop in the surfboard and he put a Wi-Fi service back in the uh, rescue shack and now he sells this as a product. Uh, I've already mentioned Google Glass and how about, I used to tell jokes that every light bulb in the world would have its own internet address. And now I can't make jokes about it anymore because recently someone sent me an IPv6 radio-enabled light bulb. It costs about $20. It's an LED bulb. It probably will last about 15 years, so the price is actually not unreasonable. The cost of putting in the radio and the IPv6 is about 20, 50 cents or so. So it's not an unreasonable uh, initial or additional cost. And of course, you can now control the bulb, bulb remotely or you can sense what its current state is. Of course, uh, access control now becomes an issue because you don't want the 15-year-old next door to reprogram your house while you're away. So those of you who care about security will uh, surely be interested in that. Um, so I think we have a variety of 21st century experiences to uh, anticipate or to already talk about. Uh, in the case of the internet-enabled refrigerator, uh, some of you will, will know that my uh, fantasy there is that everything that goes into the refrigerator is carrying an RFID tag so the refrigerator knows what it has inside. And that way, while you're off at work or at school or something, the refrigerator is, is surfing the internet looking for recipes that it could make with what it knows it has inside. So when you get home, you see a nice list of things to have for dinner on the display. Uh, you could extrapolate this to going on vacation and getting an email. It's from your refrigerator. Uh, you know, it, I don't know uh, how long the milk has been in there. Oh no, the milk has been in there for three weeks and it's going to crawl out on its own if you, uh, if you don't do something about it. Of course, the Japanese have messed this up a little bit because they have an internet-enabled bathroom scale. And you, you step on the scale and it figures out which family member you are based on your weight and sends that information to the uh, doctor to become part of your medical record. The bad part is that the refrigerator is on the same network. And so when you get home, you see diet recipes coming up on the display, or maybe it just refuses to open because it knows you're on a diet. Um, so I've already mentioned a number of these other appliances. What about internet-enabled clothing? I mean, we're starting to hear more and more about instrumented clothing for health purposes to keep track of vital signs, for example, or even more elaborate cases, uh, perhaps you're a diabetic and you're wearing uh, an insulin pump. Uh, there are uh, devices and programs that are made now to track a very fine grain of the blood uh, sugar level of someone uh, with diabetes so that now you can see uh, what the um, body state is over uh, at fine grain over the course of 24 hours, for example, as opposed to only getting samples once every few hours or maybe even only once a day. So this continuous monitoring is actually a very powerful idea. Although I wondered, you know, if we had socks that were internet enabled, uh, you can imagine sending, an, uh, uh, sending a, uh, a sort of a multicast around the house if, if you can't find the sock and you get back a little note saying, hello, this is sock L144, I'm under the sofa in the living room. So we've solved the problem of missing sock, which I consider to be a you know, major contribution to society. But there are, you know, we should all feel responsible for the consequences of our uh, technical implementations and designs and inventions. Um, imagine that um, in a different scenario, uh, you, uh, you call home and you say, uh, hi, honey, I'm going to be working late in the lab tonight. And there's a pause. And uh, the spouse says, well, that's very interesting, sweetheart, but your shirt is down at 19th Street at the bar. So maybe this internet-enabled clothing is a really bad idea and we should not foist that on, uh, on the community. What about entertainment equipment at home? Uh, if you're like me, you have a lot of boxes and you have remote controls for them, every one with a different little IR gadget, and you fumble around trying to figure out which one is the right one, and when you finally get that figured out, that's the one with the dead battery. So my proposal is to put all the entertainment gear on the net, use your mobile on the net as the uh, device to control them all, and more important, once you introduce that kind of a, a standard interface, third-party companies could offer to you the ability to manage your entertainment equipment, put the movies on the right places, put the music on the iPods, and so on. And all you have to do is go to a website and check on the things that you're interested in. This sort of standardization is a really powerful tool, and it's something that we should keep in mind 
uh, as we want to um, allow third parties to invent new ways of providing products and services to us. The smart grid program is another example of this where uh, electrical devices that consume uh, electricity uh, keep track of their usage and provide that information to you on a fairly fine-grained scale. So at the end of the month, you can see what choices in your lifestyle produce the you know, 10,000 kilowatt bill that you got, as opposed to wondering what did you do to produce that. The other side of it is that these devices can also respond to information saying we're approaching a peak load with the air conditioners and the uh, water heaters, please uh, stop for the next 15 minutes. That's perfectly feasible as devices become more uh, computer and internet enabled. Uh, we could imagine a similar kind of thing about food and ecology feedback, uh, sensor systems that tell us uh, what our carbon footprint is. Or I've even seen an internet-enabled fork that will tell you whether you're eating too fast. You know, it's, I think we're probably pushing the limits of something here, but you know, it, it's technically feasible to do that. And of course, there are the Google self-driving cars I understand that this fleet of some two dozen cars has now gone 400,000 miles in, in the city of San Francisco without any accidents except for one, and that was when the car was under control of a human being, not under control of the computer. But if you think for just a moment about how those things work, first of all, they're using LIDARs that are getting a 360-degree view uh, of everything, so they're paying attention more than we do when we're driving. Uh, they have video information, they have very high quality GPS, they have maps and everything else. They could even, not yet, but at some point they should be able to communicate with each other. So imagine when four cars come up to a four-way stop, they can negotiate to decide which one goes through as opposed to one of those macho moments when somebody shows up and insists on blasting through because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who got there first, they own the street. So this idea of having cars that are capable of autonomous operation is pretty important. What I didn't understand uh, until recently, though, is that they are not absolutely autonomous in the following sense. Uh, they're constantly able to get information from the Google data centers, and they're reporting information back. So uh, in a, a kind of a silly example, imagine a car drives up to an intersection it's never been at before, but it knows everything that every other car has ever seen at that intersection and figures out that this is a tree because that's the thing that's always been there for all the other cars. So don't wait for the tree to cross the street because it isn't going to. Unless, of course, a human walks out from behind the tree, in which case you want to be very careful not to run over the human. But this notion of cars that learn from each other and become increasingly capable uh, is something that's is uh, very attractive because human beings often don't do that. So we might actually have cars that are smarter than we are in some sense, at least with regard to paying attention to the rules of the road. Uh, here's another example uh, of what I think is common. Uh, these are sensor networks. This particular one is a commercial product uh, from a company called Archrock, uh, which was acquired by Cisco Systems a couple of years ago. I have, this is an IPv6 radio-based self-forming network. Each one of the devices run on two AA batteries. They last almost a year. They are sensing the temperature, humidity, and light levels in the house. Every five minutes, they report their state uh, to a, uh, uh, a server down in my basement. So at the end of the year, I actually have a very, very good engineering sense of how well the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system has worked, as opposed to purely anecdotal information. And having good engineering data is often very helpful when you're trying to uh, adjust for, in this case, the uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. One room in the house is the wine cellar, very important to me, and it's important to keep it uh, below 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that room is alarmed, and if the temperature goes up above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I get an SMS on my mobile to tell me there's a problem. This has happened a couple of times when I've been away, and nobody has been there to reset the cooling system. And so one time for three days, every five minutes, I got a note saying the wine is warming up. By the time I got home, it was 70 degrees in the wine cellar, which is you know, not terribly damaging, but it worried me enough that I called the Archrock guys and says, do you make remote actuators? And they said, yes. So that's a weekend project to put in the remote actuator. And then I said, do you have strong authentication on this uh, actuator system? Because the 15-year-old next door, you know, I don't want him messing around with my wine cellar. So they said yes, and so that's all fine. Then I got to thinking, you know, I can actually tell if somebody's gotten into the wine cellar when I'm away, because I can tell if the lights have gone off and on, but I don't know what they did in there. 
So my next project is to put an RFID tag on every wine bottle, and that way I can do an instantaneous inventory uh, on demand to figure out if any bottles have left the wine cellar without my permission. Um, and I was boasting of this design to an engineer friend. He said, there's a bug in your design. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle. So now we have to put sensors in the cork. And as long as we do that, we might as well sample the esters to figure out how, you know, what's the state of the wine, is it ready to drink or not. So before you open the bottle, you interrogate the cork. And if it turns out that's the bottle that got up to 80 degrees, uh, that's the one you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. So this is all a very practical thing they have around the house. It's actually an, an, uh, an illustrative example, though, of having sensors, uh, environmental sensors, security sensors, uh, appliance control systems integrated into uh, both our offices and our residences, uh, in our cars and, po and possibly also on our person. So this is cert certainly what's coming. Uh, so just to uh, look uh, kind of uh, lightly at 21st century experiences that I think we all have had or will have, one of them is the mobiles that have GPS receivers in them or are able to figure out where they are based on triangulation of the base stations. Uh, since they know where we are, or they can know where we are, then it's a well-formed question to say, where's the nearest gas station, where's the nearest Thai restaurant, please give me directions to get there, uh, or uh, please tell me when I need to adapt my um, uh, directions in order to get around traffic tie-ups and things of that sort. These things also facilitate all kinds of other transactions. So in some sense, these devices are becoming uh, extremely powerful adjuncts to our daily uh, activities. Uh, I've already mentioned the Carnegie Mellon uh, work where uh, you literally project controls onto any available surface and you interact with them. But this raises a very interesting question, and I think that it's one that I hope occupies at least some of you, and that's the question of how to uh, adapt our social conventions in order to uh, make sensible use of the technology that we're developing. Let me give you an example. I believe that we inadvertently do things uh, to each other unintentionally because we don't fully appreciate the social implications of our actions. The example I would give you is the mobile phone, which is capable of taking pictures and uploading them. Uh, onto the internet and, and uh, making them available to the general public or to a small group of people uh, or anything in between. Uh, imagine for a moment that you've gone to Cairo and you're standing in front of the pyramids and you would like to have a photograph of yourself in front of the pyramids, so you ask someone to take a picture. And they do this, but there's another person who is next to you, we'll call that person Joe, and he is caught in the picture. Now, you don't care about Joe, you don't know who he is, but you post the picture on your website or on Flickr or YouTube or something else. Um, and someone else is roaming around looking for pictures of pyramids and finds this picture and, and happens to know Joe and tags Joe and says, oh, that's Joe. And uh, someone else is looking around for pictures of Joe encounters this image and notices that Joe was in Cairo at a particular date and time, except Joe told this third party that he was in London. And so now suddenly Joe is in trouble because someone has found a picture of him that was identified by some other party that you had the picture taken for. You had no clue that you were going to cause this problem for Joe. I'm not quite sure what the correct uh, social uh, you know, convention should be, but I think, for me anyway, this illustrates the fact that we are not very conscious or uh, the consequences of our action in this online environment. So I, I don't know how this is all going to evolve, but I know that eventually we'll figure this out because we have other social conventions that you all do exercise um, without thinking particularly. Imagine when we're walking down the street towards each other. Generally speaking, in most cultures, you get out of each other's way because that's more convenient. You could imagine where you just stand in front of each other and dare the other person to get out of the way, but that's so socially inconvenient, we just generally don't do that. I think that the technologies that we are introducing into our social environment have similar kinds of challenges hiding behind them, and as technologists, we owe it to the rest of the public to actually think our way through what those implications are. Now, let me suggest a little um, 
exercise for you, it comes in two parts. The first part is we go back from this year, 2013, to 1963. And the question is, what will happen to us? And one of my predictions is that most of us will end up breaking our noses sometime during the first week because we will have walked into doors that we thought were going to open for us automatically. And of course, our friends will look at us and say, why did you do that? And you'd say, well, where I come from, the door is open for us. And our friends would say, well, there's this thing called a knob, and you have to turn it you know, to open the door. And there, you, know, you can extrapolate this. Imagine that uh, you've gone into the lavatory, and you're, you're standing there with your hands under the faucet. And your friend is looking at you saying, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm waiting for the water to come out. And he said, well, there's this, this faucet handle. You, know, you have to turn it for the water to come out. And say, well, where I come from, uh, you know, the, the faucets turn on automatically. And we won't even go to the part where they want to know why you didn't flush the toilet. So um, the important point here is that we would be surprised by things that didn't work. So now the other part of the uh, exercise is to imagine someone from 2063 coming to our year 2013. Uh, what would we expect from 2063 that wouldn't be available now? And I don't know the answer to that, and I'm not going to speculate that's homework assignment for you. But in some sense, isn't this exactly what you are doing? You are inventing the 2063 world in 2013. And whatever it is that you're doing eventually will emerge into that 50 years from now scene. And then, of course, some of us, uh, probably not me, will be able to answer the question definitively because we'll be around in 2063. But I want to finish up uh, this morning uh, with uh, two other points. One of them is that all of our work on computer uh, to human interaction is actually uh, preparing the way for uh, other kinds of interactions, like computer to computer interaction. You hear about the Internet of Things, you hear machine to machine interactions, and of course they're fancifully represented by R2D2 and C3PO. But in a sense, as we learn more and more about how to interact with other species, uh, we are learning more and more about how to interact with something that isn't us and isn't in particular, uh, it doesn't have the same view of the world that we do. So the fanciful interactions with E.T., or perhaps even more interestingly, uh, Penny Patterson and her interactions with Coco, the signing gorilla uh, in, uh, in California, are all examples of things that the work that we do in computer-human interaction uh, will eventually benefit from. And maybe someday, if we actually are visited by uh, you know, aliens, uh, we may actually have a clue about how we would learn to communicate with them. Uh, I want to finish up uh, with a topic that I consider to be very important for all of us. In some sense, we are in an environment where the computers have given us the most flexible possible human interface that we could uh, ever imagine. We have infinite possibilities in the software to make these machines behave in whatever way we can figure out how to program. And in spite of that flexibility, in spite of the richness of potential, we have not done a great job of making our systems accessible to people who have various kinds of disabilities. So I think it's a mixed bag. I think there are some very successful results, and there are other cases where we haven't done very well at all. And I'm, I, this is not my field, but I care about it a lot. I happen to be hearing impaired, and uh, I have friends who have other kinds of impairments, including visual impairments or even motor impairments, and all of them encounter difficulties interacting with the systems that uh, you and I uh, use and design. So we have screen readers, for example, but in a sense they, are, they struggle to present to someone who can't read the screen an in, some kind of uh, indication of what is on the screen and what can you do with what's being presented. It's a tough problem because the serial uh, presentation, audio uh, presentation is a serial function, and yet the screen is, is two-dimensional, in fact, could even be three-dimensional as we get to haptic and 3D kinds of, of interfaces. And how on earth you organize uh, information in some param uh, either parametric way or algorithmic way, I think, is very, very difficult. Uh, also, if, if you've ever dived down into details and in trying to make a system more accessible by tweaking various parameters, it can be pretty daunting to figure out exactly how to get it to behave the way you would like or that's useful to you. 
I think we need a stronger response than uh, purely parametric or purely algorithmic responses. I think if those of us who design interfaces to applications should really be thinking from the get-go, how do I make this application accessible? Now, in order to really understand the answer to that question or to fabricate the answer to the question, you actually have to understand something about the challenges that people experience. What problems are, do they encounter depending on various uh, disabilities? And I can tell you as a hearing impaired person that n not, the answer is not necessarily signing. The answer is not necessarily louder. Sometimes the answer is captioning. Sometimes the answer is changing the uh, frequencies so that you know, it's in a range that you can actually hear as opposed to the one you can't. Every one of these disabilities is unique and peculiar to each individual, and you need to have the ability to adapt uh, the response of the system to the individual's needs, not to some generic notion. I, I, this, is, this actually happened to me once. I went to an airport at the check-in counter, and I said, I'm hearing impaired, and I may not hear the announcements, can, so can you please make sure I get on the plane at the right time? And the desk clerk looked at me and said, do you need a wheelchair? <laughs> and I thought, well, that suggested the sort of paper-thin understanding of disability in some parts of the public. So I want us not to be like the desk clerk. I want us to recognize the richness of the problem space that uh, we have to respond to. Standards can be really helpful. Uh, and standard APIs and things like that, hooks that we can use to reach functionality from different presentations, from different interaction modes, and that's very important. So I want to encourage you, those of you who are interested in this topic, to join uh, Greg Vanderheiden and me uh, and Vicki Hanlon at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We'll have a session on accessibility, looking at some of uh, Greg's ideas on the, what he calls GPII, or Global Public uh, Inclusive Infrastructure to give some ideas about how you build a, a framework in which accessibility becomes possible. Well, uh, that brings me to uh, the close of my formal remarks this morning. I'm happy to engage in Q&A if you happen to wish to do so, and I understand that uh, Wendy is going to come up and manage that process. So, Wendy, if I welcome you to the stage, and I'll thank all of you for your attention this morning. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, we've been collecting uh, questions from the audience. The student volunteers are going up and down the aisles and getting them on cards. I have quite a collection already. So I'm but, going to join um, you over here. You should come and join me. I and see I they have the bottle of vodka waiting for us. That's <laughs> very good. Here we are. This should make the session much more funny to me, maybe not to you. But. So. We have several questions that are getting at some of the same kinds of issues, and so I'll paraphrase a little bit. Um, so there's one that I think is really interesting, because you're a mixed audience between the human-computer interaction folks who think a lot about a lot of these issues, and you'll see many of these things actually in the um, interactivity area just after this session. Um, and then there's the ECRC, uh, other conferences coming together here. So this is an interesting opportunity for us. So here, do you really think that the problem is to learn to adapt our behavior as human beings to the devices rather than the devices to human behavior or skills? And just one last piece, yes. do you really want to be programmed by your bathroom scale? <laughs> well, I'm already programmed by my chief of staff, so you know, it won't be a very big change. <laughs> Uh, the honest answer is I would like the system to adapt to my needs, not the other way around. And I think we have relied extraordinarily heavily on human ability to adapt to our not-so-great interfaces. And so here, I think we have an opportunity, because of the richness of these systems, to make them adapt more readily. And I love the idea of having the computer being part of my sensory environment, engaging in the way I interact with other people. Right. I'm, I would like very much to have a conversation. Instead of typing search terms into the Google search bar, I would like to be able to either say or type a sentence or a paragraph even saying, this is what I'm trying to find, or maybe this is why I'm trying to find it, or this is the problem I'm trying to solve, or this is the answer that I'm looking for. And although today we try to infer what that might be in the choice of response from a search, 
a more natural interaction would be the one that I would have with a librarian when I walk into the library and I say, I'm trying to figure out something about you know, the uh, uh, diet of the Neanderthal period. Uh, what do we know about that and where should I look? Okay. Okay. All right, I'll try to process this. Um, how do we reconcile the Internet of Things with privacy issues? Well, uh, that's actually a very good question. Some of you will remember Scott McNeely as the former chairman and CEO of Sun Microsystems who some 10 or 15 years ago said, there isn't any privacy, get over it. Um, I hope that we can do better than that. But in, in honest terms, uh, we have eroded uh, our privacy substantially with the technologies that we've invented, which we use for useful and convenient things. Um, I can't speak for the European scene as, as well as I might try for the American scene, but Americans tend to give up their privacy in exchange for convenience. Uh, if, if you have credit cards and at the end of the year you look at the summary mm -hmm. of what you have purchased, where you've been, what airplanes you took and everything else, the credit card company knows an enormous amount about your habits and interests, and yet we don't cancel our credit cards because they're too convenient. So uh, I think that we're back again to the social convention question that I tried to uh, raise earlier. I think that we're going to have to fight really hard to retain privacy uh, in this increasingly um, online environment. Okay. Um, I have one question which is not actually for you, but for you. Um, it says, where is the two o'clock session? It's not in the program. And the answer is there are two programs, or at least at least two. Um, the CHI 2013 program is for people who registered at CHI. I'm not sure if yours is listed as ECRC or as a CHI event. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, is Vicky floating around somewhere to tell us? But what I should say is that all of you who are registered for ECRC and all of you who are registered for CHI are welcome to attend each other's sessions. So after this session is over, we have an expanded CHI 2013 interactivity slot for one hour. And all of you who are coming in new for ECRC are more than welcome to join us. That will be on the second floor in what's called the Hall Mayo. Um, and uh, after that, there will be ongoing sessions for CHI and ongoing sessions for ECRC. And all of you are welcome we to go to any of them. Over here. Do we have a response? I'm sorry? Why do you accept questions only in writing? Do you think we are speech impaired? I certainly don't think you're speech impaired, but there is actually um, a long history of doing this. This is a CHI convention, and it's um, because people tend to make speeches from the um, microphones, and so <laughs> there's a way of getting the actually, speaker to do help, more of the speech. This helps me a great deal because I'm hearing impaired, and so having written questions has been very useful. So right. I'm the, I'm the excuse for okay. that, yes. You can blame me if you like. And so I will continue with the questions here. Um, what is the 21st, what do you think the 21st internet experience will be for people in developing countries? So we're already seeing um, the trends in the developing world. One of them, of course, is the rapid penetration of mobile technology into that world. Many of those people will have their first interaction with the World Wide Web through a mobile. Some of them may never leave the mobile. And as they become more and more capable, uh, that may not be a, a, a particular limitation for them. One thing I can tell you is, is very likely to happen is that speeds will be going up both in the wireless and the wire, wired world. And second, the devices that we carry around with us and the devices that we encounter in our homes, offices, cars, hotel rooms, and so on, will be interacting with each other. And so a typical thing, uh, whether it's in the developing world or uh, the developed world, would be to walk into a hotel room with a mobile. The mobile figures out that there's a high resolution display on the wall, and it can use that in lieu of or in addition to uh, the tiny little display that you normally have on the mobile. This notion of interacting with the World Wide Web applications with more than one device at the same time is going to become much more common than it is today. 
So the, I think the developing world is rapidly catching up, at least on the wireless side, with the rest of the world. This is an interesting one that just came in. Um, just quickly. We have an answer for yes. It's room room 341 is where the um, uh, session with Greg Vanderheiden uh, is on uh, accessibility. So that's on the third floor. Okay. That's in this building, correct? Yes, it okay. is. So you'll go up the escalators, and all of the conference um, rooms are on the second and third floor. Got it. Okay. All right. New one. Um, so, given what you know now. How would you design the internet differently? This is question number 105. <laughs> uh, the first question is, did you have any idea what was going to happen? You know, this is 105. What would you do differently? I have two answers to this. First of all, uh, I would have picked 128-bit address space in the first place so we wouldn't have to do the V4 to V6 switchover. Uh, and, but here we are. And second, uh, I would have put in a lot more security than we uh, had initially if the technology had been readily available. And it was not. Here's the irony of all this. Bob Kahn and I started the work in 1973. First papers published in 1974. We start implementation in 1975. We go through four iterations, split the IP protocol off in TCP. About 1978, we are at the point where we're solidifying the TCP IP protocols in detail. The previous year, my two colleagues, Marty Hellman and Whitfield Diffie, published their first paper on public key cryptography. And they didn't implement anything. They speculated about the existence of functions that would behave this way. It was some time after that that the RSA algorithms and some of the other uh, variants uh, were implemented. So that technology arrived too late for us to inject into the internet design. So we went ahead with what was essentially a relatively unprotected environment. Some people will say to you, and I'm, I'm probably among them, that if we had tried to concentrate too much on securing the system, we might never have gotten anything implemented or have gotten it to work. It might have been just too heavyweight, given the cost of the computers of the time and the very low ban bandwidths available to us uh, in, the, uh, in the networks. Uh, there's one other element of schizophrenia in all of this. In 1975, this is very early on in the evolution of the protocols, I started working with the American National Security Agency on the design of a secure version of the internet. And we had access to very high quality cryptographic capability. The trouble is it was all classified. And so I couldn't share that information with any of my colleagues who didn't have clearances, and that was most of them. So uh, the result is that I've you know, had this very solid, uh, you know, secure system available, but only to the military and the rest of it. And of course, we're all living with the experimental internet, IP version 4, and we're only just now getting to the production internet in IP version 6. That actually is related to the next question, which I think um, is something, uh, an experience many of us have. So this person waited for 10 minutes for an elevator and then has had a, tr a trouble getting the internet connection for the past 24 hours. Is this um, uh, here in, in town? Here, here in, in town, right? In I, I assume whoever wrote okay. this question, I assume this is a slightly frustrated, hot off the presses kind of question. Yes. Um, how are we going to enhance the infrastructure support for all of these new interfaces? So if all this new stuff comes in and grabs even more of this, how do we, so, how do we handle that? Uh, I hope that you all appreciate that have, being the designer of the protocols does not make me the implementer of every version of ISP <laughs> all over the world. I mean, it's not your um, problem. So the first, actually several responses. First of all, um, we run into problems when we have a really high density of users. The, the Wi-Fi protocols are not necessarily wonderful about uh, handling very, very high density loads. And in fact, there's an example of this. There's, uh, there's an event called... Um, campus party. Uh, it started in Spain. It's been going on for about 20 years now. When I was first introduced to it, I thought it was about beer or something like that. It turned out it's about young people, 5,000 of them getting together to learn about programming and to learn from each other and from people who teach classes. But I bring this up because there's such a high density of users in these events that go on for a week that they had to use wired ethernet in order to give them enough capacity because the wireless protocols are not adequate. 
So uh, ironically, I found an Ethernet cable in my hotel room, and it works great. And I don't have a problem with the Wi-Fi because I'm not using it. Uh, there is an answer, however. Um, it lies in the higher frequency spectrum. In the 60 gigahertz range, you, uh, you could, first of all, you could get more than a, a couple of gigahertz of capacity at that frequency. Second, because it's in the oxygen absorption band, the signal actually dies out in the atmosphere after about a half a mile. So these higher frequency options mean that you can reuse the frequency more readily. So it's higher capacity and reuse is more natural. So I am hoping, frankly, that we will see, if not Wi-Fi, then some variations on uh, wireless systems that will use much higher frequencies. The other observation is that there are better ways of sharing the spectrum than what we currently do today. It's not just a matter of time division multiplexing, which is approximately what's going on with Wi-Fi, uh, plus some channelization. There are lots of parameters that you can use in order to have a, re a receiver distinguish one signal from another and you know, essentially isolate the one that it wants. We're not using the spectrum very well right now. And technically, uh, we could be using the same frequency bands to cover a great deal more use than we do today. If you go out with a radiometer and you measure a fairly broadband chunk of the spectrum, which is currently allocated in the sign, you find that it's about 2% occupied. So we're doing a really crappy job of allocating radio spectrum. I won't go into my big rant, but there are ways of doing cohabitation in common frequency bands much more efficiently than we do today by having much, much smarter receivers. So something that some of our colleagues at SIGCOM and elsewhere could work on. OK. OK. We're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to ask one last question. Uh -oh. um, do you see the, you know, Mark Weiser's vision of ubiquitous computing? Um, do you see that as sort of the ultimate vision, or is there something beyond? And do you see it as a utopic or a dystopic vision? Um, OK, so first of all, I don't think that's the end, end point. I think it's a really interesting uh, intermediate stage where computing capability, conventional computing capability is embedded in a great many things that we surround us and are uh, interacting with us and with each other. Um, I see this as having both uh, uto utopic and dystopic elements, though. Uh, any infrastructure can be abused, and we're seeing that with the internet. There's lots of abuse of that system. And the best we can do, since we can't absolutely prevent all of those abuses, is to try to resist them somehow, either by building better software that resists the bad stuff or detecting that somebody has done something harmful and telling them that that's socially unacceptable and there will be consequences if you're caught or just telling people don't do that because it just isn't nice. Um, so that's, I mean, we are going to be faced, as we always have, with uh, the use of technology for both uh, harm and good. I hope in the case of internet, more good will happen than harm. But I don't think it's the end point. And the reason I don't think that is that uh, we're already beginning to see um, biological computational capabilities showing up. I mean, the idea of having a self-organizing bio-based computing capability uh, is not crazy at all. And with Craig Vender's work on uh, creating artificial uh, life forms and on nanotechnology using DNA to assemble proteins that will fold in particularly useful forms or nanomaterials that have properties that don't normally occur uh, in nature, all of those things suggest to me that at some point the notion of computing will go very far beyond what we think of as a chip that performs binary operations into something substantially more complicated. And I think the answer or the, the evidence of this is right here in our wetware. We obviously have something in our heads capable of doing some pretty remarkable things. And it's not done using silicon wafers. Thank you very much. Okay. I would like to thank you for your wonderful talk. And I would like to, on behalf of Hi 2013, and I know I speak for Wendy Hall for ECRC. I would like to welcome all of you and uh, invite you to go to the second floor to the Hall Mayo, enjoy the coffee break, and try out the uh, interactivity exhibit, which has 78 different interactive 
technologies that some of which relate to things that you were talking about. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.